ask Professor Prepares to come on stage. I just want to share with you the details of what's going to follow next. It will be a very exciting panel I'll be introducing to you. It's a high-powered panel of government officials. We'll have investors. We'll have bankers including, listen to this, one who for two years was ranked one of the ten most powerful women in business in the Middle East. Clearly, they mean business. And I don't think you want to miss your take on the African Economic Outlook Report, which will also be unveiled once we finish with the presentation by Professor Raman. When Dr. Deshin arrives and delivers his remarks, we will be going into the unveiling of the report and we'll make sure you receive your copy as you leave this place. If I may invite Professor Kevin Chika Urama to the stage for his presentation. Let's give him a round of applause, please, ladies and gentlemen. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Please allow me to stand on established protocols for a moment of time. It is my great pleasure, on behalf of the African Development Bank Group, to present to you today the key findings of the African Development Bank's Africa's Economic Outlook for the year 2023 on the theme Mobilizing Private Sector Financing for Climate and Green Growth in Africa. Is, a, is a, uh, in three chapters. The first one looks at the outlook for Africa with regard to macroeconomic fundamentals. The second, on how to harness those to uh, mobilize private uh, sector financing to drive climate and green growth in Africa. The third looks at how we can leverage the huge assets we have on the continent natural capital to be able to drive inclusive growth and climate for development in Africa. Then we will have recommendations, which we try to focus on clear, practical actions that can be taken at different levels by different stakeholders. I'll get to that. Let us just get into the first chapter of the report. In the first chapter, we we'll look at Africa's economic outlook. As you can see on this slide, the outlook is positive. Despite the confluence of shocks that we have discussed here, the COVID, the, the climate, and also the conflicts, and also structural changes, um, issues that remain on Africa's economy in different African regions and countries, the continent grew by 3.8% in 2022. This is higher than the 3.4% of average growth globally. Looking ahead, we see an acceleration of that growth path with 4% projected in, at the end of 2023 and 4.3% projected at the end of 2024. And five of Africa's fast growing economies are set to return to the league of the 10 fastest growing economies in the world. I think Africa needs an applause. For this performance and outlook, it's not the same across the regions. There are always heterogeneities depending on economic structures, dependence on natural resources, and other factors that you will find when you read the report in detail. I want to point out, for want of time, credit to Eastern Africa region. This region was the only region that escaped recession during the COVID-19 pandemic and has continued an upward trajectory in growth. With an estimated 5.1% GDP growth in 20, uh, 2023, in 2023, um, that will 
continue to go higher, even to 5.8. Southern Africa, on the other side, continues to face strong headwinds because of structural issues, energy shortages, and other factors were already discussed in the Macroeconomic Outlook Report launched in, 20, uh, in January this year. For the other, all the other regions, the central, the western, the northern, maintain also positive trajectory in growth. So the resilience of Africa's economies goes cuts across the regions. We will be releasing next year, um, sorry, next month, regional economic outlook reports to have deep dive analysis on each regions. And in July, we will come to you with the country focus reports that will try to have deep dives on key actions that each country needs to take depending on their own peculiarities. For this growth projection that we share, uh, if I go back there briefly, I want to make a point on the, the right side of the slide there, you find different economic groupings on the continent depending on economic characteristics, dependence on tourism, dependence of natural resources, um, resource-based economies, and so on. And then you find that only one of that uh, is actually continuing the trajectory of upward growth. We saw and reported to you in, uh, in, in 2022 the resurgence of growth in tourism-dependent economies, but it is, this is now going down because of the tapering of savings um, that we have in these uh, tourism source countries. But when you look at the uh, other ones, you find that uh, the non-resource intensive economies, which are most, much more diversified, continues to go forward with recovery. So our projection is that such economies will continue to show marked resilience in the coming years. But overall, a positive outlook. But that positive outlook comes with cautious optimism because we still continue to have challenges in several macroeconomic uh, fundamentals and their underpinnings. Here we can see, because of the uh, fiscal conditions around the world and the consolidation in fiscal policy and monetary policy, we're seeing exchange rate um, devaluations in, across several countries of this continent. And that also leads to consumer price inf inflation which we project will rise further to 15.1% at the end of this year. But the good news is that our projections show that it will go back down to um, below pre-pandemic levels by 2024, if all conditions remain the same. The third one we have also, the second issue we need to raise in the macroeconomic fundamentals is the issue around debt. And we have all been talking about it. Third vulnerabilities continues to worsen because of rapid exchange rate, depreciation, as I've already talked about, but also high primary deficits. Even though they, we also expect that this trend will go down in terms of debt to GDP ratio in the, in the, in the medium term, one point I need to make here is the right slide there, where you see that the drivers of public debt when you do a decomposition, you find that the debt creating flows points to the same issues I've raised. Projected exchange rate depreciation and high primary deficits will be greater, will have greater cumulative impacts on external debt dynamics in Africa, even more than the historical debt drivers, such as GDP growth. Why I'm stressing this is that we all know where the source of this inflation, the source of exchange rate uh, dynamics in Africa comes from the strengthening of the dollar and some other external factors, but there are also internal structural factors that different countries need to deal with. So because of this confluence of factors, we find that also debt, uh, uh, the cost of debt service is going up rapidly. And this is raising significant concerns in the financial markets with regard to potential sovereign defaults across countries. The report goes into depth regarding debt. The 
because of its importance. But, but time will not allow me to go uh, deeper to, to look at that um, at, this, at this time. But if you just look at that figure, you can see that we have risks to watch in Africa's macroeconomy. Subdued growth and softer demand in Africa's export markets continue to be a challenge. Might deepen if Russia's invasion of Ukraine continues. High interest rates, high cost of, of debt service, also associated with debt distress and potential sovereign defaults, as I've mentioned already. But the physical impacts of climate change is also creating major challenges as it often washes off hard end physical infrastructure and then have to be rebuilt. And that is creating significant challenges uh, with regard to fiscal sustainability on the continent. But one that continues to remain a concern is commodity dependence and price volatility in the commodity markets. That makes it difficult for countries to plan. It makes it difficult to be able to get enough domestic revenue to address the fiscal challenges that we have. In the last slide, I will come back to policy recommendations and actions that needs to be taken to address this. Let me just, after that snapshot, go into the second chapter, which is um, private sector financing for climate and green growth on the continent. This is the theme of these annual meetings, and we've had our leaders uh, intervene on their opinions regarding this. I have learned quite a lot from those discussions. And one thing that comes out clear, and it's also what the report settles on, is that the public sector cannot do it alone. We need the private sector. But needing the private sector doesn't mean that the public sector should scale down its financing. And you will see the reasons for making that statement as we go into the report itself. First, the banking, what used to be the thought that there are significant trade-offs between going green and doing climate smart development, poverty alleviation, and other socioeconomic goals. We find in the report that green growth positively correlates with GDP growth. It also correlates with climate resilience and climate readiness. So embarking on green growth, which is what we're all talking about, and climate resilient development can actually be a source of addressing the long-lasting development challenges on this continent. So if you look at that, then you think about what I call Africa's green development paradox. And you have that in natural capital, you have that in population and human capital, you even have that in knowledge capital for Africa, where you have abundance but scarcity. So here, just on the left side, market size of Africa, almost $3 trillion. The population of 1.4 billion people, that's significant human capital, the size of China. But it's projected to go to about 2.4 billion in 2050. Mostly youth, innovative, creative, and ready to explore the world. We have significant natural resource endowments. We have talked about green minerals in, in, in Africa, the 65% of uncultivated arable land in Africa. We've talked about 30% of mineral deposits and several, just name it, everything is here on the continent. And if I quote the president of the, of the African Development Bank, Dr. Deshina, at his opening speech, he says, God really loves Africa. So with this, you also see that Africa has green technology potentials. I'll just give one example. Renewable energy, which we all talk about. The technical the potential in renewable energy, 44.8% of that potential is in Africa. And we also have low legacy in high emissions infrastructure. So it's easier for us to build these climate resilient green infrastructures that we've been talking about. So instead of having a late comer advantage, I mean, we have a late comer advantage 
as one of my favorite professors, Professor Yeyinka, had written in a book many years ago. So we can move faster because we don't have legacy infrastructure that we have to try to rebuild and retrofit. There is also high and growing political will for climate and green growth in Africa. And COP27, hosted by the Arab Republic of Egypt, was a clear example. This meeting, clear example, heads of states, prime ministers, ministers intervening, and everybody is one voice. Africa needs to act. The world needs to act to support Africa. And global financial institutions need to be reformed to support Africa better. But well, here is a paradox. You look at the right, right side there, you find that when you look at all the 40 global green growth indicators, Africa is not doing well. We are underperforming our potential. It's the third there, just doing better than Middle East and South Asia, but running behind East Asia and Pacific and all the other regions that we've mentioned there. A continent that has 48%, almost half of a potential in renewable energy. We should be leading, not running behind others. You go to, I think about the private sector, which is the topic of this chapter. There's also very little appetite shown in investing in this huge market potential. With all we have said already, I could say, and I hope you would agree, that Africa is the current and future market frontier for climate and green development in the world. So when I look at this report, I'm wondering what, what is the private sector doing? Here is opportunities to make money and deliver global public goods. So you'll be doing well by doing good. So what are we waiting for? So if you look at the share of private and public financing uh, for climate and uh, climate finance, uh, if we just focus on climate, in 2019 and 2020, we look at the, this side of, the, of the, the graph, you see that Africa is very small. On the other side, you'll find that the total climate finance to Africa, we've already heard that figure, is 29.5 billion. But the private sector has only done the paltry 4.2 billion only 14% of the total. The other challenge that we found in the report is that the leverage ratio in Africa is far lower than the rest of the world. So for every dollar in public financing mobilized in Africa, we are only able to mobilize to leverage 0.16% uh, uh, in private capital. In some other regions, that figure is up to 18 18 uh, in, uh, instead of uh, as low as it is on the continent. Then another thing that links to what we presented in our AEO, which was a bit confounding, is that climate finance is inversely related to climate vulnerability. So the more vulnerable a country is, the less likely to receive climate finance. So that defeats the purpose of climate finance, especially if that was supposed to be addressing climate impacts. So the size of the need of climate finance on the continent is huge. 2.7 trillion cumulatively from 2020 to 2030. That's about 24 billion, uh, sorry, 242.4 billion annually. And if you calculate if the private sector were to come in and take opportunity, this market share that we're talking about, we have a gap in terms of climate financing needs of 213 billion US dollars annually between now and 2030. And that curve there just shows you the growth rate to be able to meet our nationally determined contributions. And a pause there is just to remind us that if Africa doesn't achieve the NDCs, the Paris Agreement will not be achieved. The Sustainable Development Goals will not be achieved. And this was enshrined in the Paris Agreement, recognizing 
that there are conditional actions which have to be fund, funded through the global uh, 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 public private finance. What are the sources and, and the target sectors of that small amount of uh, private sector financing that we've seen? On the right there, you can see the types of instruments that they've used to fund the continent, that 4.2 billion. But then if you look at the right there, something is also jumping out there. Energy sector, which is renewable energy sector, takes almost 74% of the total, leaving a paltry amount for adaptation, loss and damage, and other social needs that are equally important if we have to address climate and green growth challenges on the continent. That again links to the structure of climate finance as we discussed in the AEO 2022 that is biased against adaptation. So for private sector, there, is, there are reasons and you will find in the report why this is the case, but the bank also is doing a lot of work uh, in adaptation benefit mechanism and other, other instruments that can help to address some of those bottlenecks so that climate finance can go into the adaptation sectors. Investment opportunities are huge in all the other sectors. Agriculture, up to one trillion market in 2030. Energy, about the same size, one trillion. ICT, see the growth on ICT, that's only for 2023. And we talk about electric vehicles, which is growing rapidly at 20, 22% growth annually. So if you think about all the resource endowments that we have and the cost competitiveness advantage, which the president mentioned, it costs three times more to build um, a lithium ion precursor factory in China and the United States than building it in Africa. So for me, that's actually huge opportunities to reduce cost of production. But another aspect is reducing the carbon footprint of products. Because the current model of international trade, where we trade in raw materials, distant lands, and bring back finished products, carries with it a carbon footprint. We can cut that off. But it can also help reduce, I mean, address poverty alleviation and also other social development challenges by creating jobs where the sources of raw materials are. And then if you move forward, you find that Africa is not fully, in fact, I will not even use the word fully, it's not really leveraging this huge market that we are seeing. The president already gave us the figures around about the uh, um, you know cumulative green bonds of 2.3 that reached 2.2 trillion um, at the end of 2022. Africa has only 0.2 percent of that. But if you look at all the other aspects, even the, the, the voluntary carbon markets, Africa's share is very low. Every aspect that you look at, the only place that Africa seems to be doing better than other regions is in blended finance instruments. Going forward, what then are the key enablers? Because you'll be asking, why is it not happening? If you look at this side, the answers come very clear. Countries that have less public climate finance will have less private climate finance. Because we find on that right side here that there is a high level of complementarity between public finance and private finance for climate change and green growth. The growth of, a, of the country, GNI per capita, the gross national income per capita in countries, the higher it is, the more likely that the private sector will come in. Investment risk profile, the lower it is, the more likely the, uh, that the investors will come in. But we also see climate risk score starting to come in there and public, the quality of public infrastructure. Why is this important? Growing green does not substitute building infrastructure for development. It does not substitute other development 
agendas and development goals because they are all mutually reinforcing. So for me, it's more about inclusive growth where we triangulate the economic, the environmental, and the social goals of growth. And this report and the analysis you will find just supports that. What are the barriers? Why is it not happening? Lack of strategies and implementation effectiveness. Sometimes we have strategies that are not implementable. And we also have the issue of weak regulatory structures and institutions. We have lack of investment ready project pipelines. Every time you hear this issue about project preparation facilities being needed, but also we have limited access to international markets for some of the reasons that we've already discussed in chapter one. Continuing on challenges on the supply side, limited experience by global public investors and private investors is a major issue. People read in articles about risk in one country and generalized risk in all countries. And that creates a disincentive for investment into African countries that are doing well and have very low risk profiles. That needs to change. We have information asymmetry that is deriving from that limited experience and the way we are making investment decisions based on what we read or see in televisions uh, without really having local knowledge of those countries that we are talking about. And these two leads to the perceived high investment risk on Afri in Africa, normally refers to an investment pre uh, premium in, on the continent. And credit rating agencies are not out of it because some of those biases feed into credit ratings and that leads to higher uh, cost of capital and it leads to a lot of investment, fly, investor flight from the continent. Let me just dwell on that risk profile issue for, for a, a short while. The default rates on the continent, this is studies that were done by Moody's Analytics. 14 years of studies. And then in 2020, they repeated it and they find that Africa's risk of default in infrastructure investment is around 1.9. Compare that to 12.4 in Eastern Europe and North America, 6.6. .6. So countries that are not defaulting are not receiving financing. It's really difficult for me to understand. But if you look there, that low default rates and poor investment sometimes is not based on actual experience on those, on, on those countries. And a study by UNDP shows that if the risk ratings of Africa were done properly and not based on biased information, Africa could save up to 74.5 billion. That's a huge amount of savings. Then we go to chapter three, natural capital for green growth in Africa. This one, I'll be very quick because we all know about that. Here on the left side is the natural capital resource endowment on the continent by time, both renewable and non-renewable. When you get the report, you get the details. But let's look at the right side there, valued at 6.2 trillion US dollars in 2018. But the important thing here is to see that even that natural capital per capita is, de is declining from about 4,000 uh, uh, US dollars to, up to about 2.8 thousand, uh, 2,800 and something US dollars. So continued dependence on natural capital uh, in terms of the without adding value is not a good development strategy. I've already talked about the energy potential and on the map, that side, side, we disaggregate the potentials by regions. Please, I'll call on you to read the report to get um, uh, more details regarding this. Now, with there are ample opportunities on the continent to actually leverage resources from several global conventions and agreements that has been reached already. But as the president had mentioned, these global conventions often are megawatts of talk sometimes but not megawatts of action. So if we can, as serious as a global community, and turn those conventions on biodiversity, on climate, and so many other conventions, you'll find them in the report. This is what you will be able to see, including potential financial flows under the 
uh, Glasgow National Development um, NDCs, and so on. Please, I'm not going to go into detail because of time. And Africa has huge natural resource endowments that provide huge opportunities for investments, again, to do good and do well. The Great Green Wall, the president talked about the Desert to Power Initiative and other things that the bank is doing, but also the huge potential in green uh, hydrogen on the continent. Every aspect you look, there are huge opportunities for investment. Here, you see that the currently Africa focuses on mining and metals, but then precursor production of you know, lithium ion batteries and all things that is needed for electric uh, vehicles. The higher you go on, I mean, on the value chain, the bigger the market size. So investing more to get Africa to that level is a great way to mobilize uh, resources that we're talking about. What are the key barriers we see? In natural resources, natural capital, of course, resource governance. We all know about the resource pores and other things. These are driven by institutional capacity and weak regulatory uh, structures. Illicit flows in resources that are not accounted is huge on the continent. There's more need for more research to even understand that better. But we also know that there are issues around organized crime and resource theft in several natural resources. Uh, sectors on the continent. Political instability often gets correlated or associated to natural resources wealth on the continent. And we don't have natural capital accounting across the continent. That needs to be done. And that also, some of these leads to tax avoidance and illicit flows, which has been estimated to be around uh, 90 billion annually. So that, if we save that, we are mobilizing already huge resources. In recommendations, we focused on what national governments need to do. Because all too often, we talk about what others need to do for us. But there are several issues. As you can see, this is the, the busiest slide with regards to policy recommendations. I won't go through all of them because of time. anti inflationary policy, uh, monetary policy is key. Please look at the report and you see the specific instruments and how to use them. Coordinated debt treatment, the president has already talked about, but we need appropriate fiscal reforms and incentives to encourage the private sector to come in. There are very clear criteria that draws investment capital. We need to do that. Talking about it will not bring the private sector because they will always focus on the bottom line. Developing long-term strategies that are clear and well-costed and implementation roadmaps is, is needed. And all these other things that are, are there, I will just not go through all of them, including deepening the uh, capital markets and also domestic revenue mobilization. Uh, and then project preparation uh, facilities at both national and regional levels. For the N MDBs, the president already talked about two key issues that the MD MDBs need to do. Let me just try to unpack them a little bit. MDBs need to align operations with the Bridge Time Initiative. We also need to expand concession of financing and grants for capacity building, even for project preparation and other aspects of development, because those will not be invested in easily by the private sector. We need to provide more risk ag agnostic and catalytic capital. We've talked about risk guarantees. That need to actually look at how to do that more and more so that we can use that to leverage um, by, by private sector coming into this sector for the continent. But on, on the whole, there's need to revisit the risk appetite of MDBs and DFIs. Because the model we have currently, we've seen, is actually going, capital seems to go in reverse, not going to the places of need because of the, a lot of the reasons we've already raised in the AEO 2022. Profitability targets is also an issue. We need to think about that and how to deal with it, being development institutions, not profiteering institutions. But we need to scale the use of innovative financing. And the president has talked about a lot of them, but also switching more from project-based to system-wide transition-based projects that has a portfolio of projects that deal, uh, helps to deal with the environment, uh, the, the business environment, the project risks associated. It's, it's very important as well. 
private sector rating agencies and international uh, community. Their own recommendations for me were very much more straightforward. The three needs to exercise market leadership and stewardship. We cannot be talking about global public goods and the need to save the global commons and acting differently. That is a moral responsibility that we all need to do. Credit rating agencies need to review their methodologies and broaden their rating frameworks so that this becomes fairer and seen as fairer. In Africa, the discussions and calls for having an African rating agency is something that's already ongoing and that seems to be in a good direction because that can help to provide data and engage with international rating agencies to help improve the knowledge about African markets and potentials. For developed countries, just one recommendation, honor commitments. And collectively, the three should champion and, and support the reform of the global financing architecture we have all talked about. In conclusion, I end in the five points that the President has raised in the opening speech. Establish your national development, green growth plans and strategies. Be clear. Establishing them based on your own context, not based on global discussions. Incentives or incentivizing green industries to realignment of, uh, of uh, subsidies and so on. Providing guarantees at scale to deal with the private sector developing pipeline of bankable projects with high risk-adjusted rates of return and also the asset rec recycling that the President has already spoken to us about. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening. Let us stand together to harness these huge opportunities for Afri in Africa for driving the collective goal of saving the planet. Thank you very much, Professor Kevin Chikawurama, Chief Economist and the Bank's Vice President for Economic Governance and Knowledge Management. Let's give him a round of applause, please. Uh, we're changing things around quickly because I know you've been uh, waiting for quite some time. And we are going to the panel discussion, but before that, I want to recognize um, distinguished guests who've just joined us. Uh, may I start with the Vice President of the United Republic of Tanzania, um, Dr. Philip Isidore Mpango is with us. He'll be talking to us later on. Uh, Vice President, if you just wave from where you are and people can know you around. Um, and then we've got um, the uh, former Dean of the Executive Board of the Bank. Uh, that was Dean uh, Lekete Makoshi. Where are you? Uh, there you are. Let's give a round of applause. This is a show of solidarity. Thank you. May I invite to the stage uh, uh, panelists? We are going now to start our discussion, and then later on we'll do the unveiling. May I invite to the stage the Right Honorable Andrew Mitchell from the United Kingdom? Please, a round of applause for Right Honorable Andrew Mitchell. Uh, he's the Minister of State for Development in Africa uh, for the United uh, Kingdom. Uh, may I invite to the stage uh, Christoph Boris, uh, Deputy Director of Multilateral Financial Affairs and Treasury Development. May I invite to the stage Dr. Heike Hamge, Managing Director for Southern and Eastern Med Mediterranean of the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development EBRD, a big applause for her, please. Let us welcome Admasu Tedesi, the President Emeritus and Group Managing Director, Eastern and Southern Trade and Development Bank. Where are you? Oh, very good, my friend. Please welcome. And then it's time for our host, for me to welcome our host to the stage because I think you can now see the guests very clearly. Let us join, join me in welcoming the governor of the Central Bank of Egypt, 
and the African Development Bank's governor for Egypt as well, His Excellency, Mr. Hassan Abdallah, who is our host. Thank you all for getting time to be on this panel. And I know you are all pressed for time. We are going to move pretty quickly, and I'll be counting, of course, on your remarks being succinct. I know I uh, write home for Andrew Mitchell. We've got to catch a flight at some point. So I will start with you listening to the presentation by Professor Raba about the economic performance and outlook of Africa. There must be things going on through your mind. What did you pick out? Well, above all, the issue today is how we bear down in a, in a very difficult period for the international system, how we uh, find the money to combat climate change, and how we focus on the SDGs, which, of course, were halfway through the period to 2030, and we're way off course of what we do. And one of the things I was thinking about when he was speaking was the fact that, that the Africa Bank is showing the way, particularly on how we tackle the need for far more money. Um, it is the challenge is to turn billions into trillions, and I see Mia Motley's Bridgetown agenda at the heart of how you do that. And what I'm particularly impressed by with the Africa Bank is the way that the Africa Bank is inventing and discovering and working up a whole series of different ways of increasing that uh, funding. So Britain is helping. We have provided these guarantees, which mean that the bank can lend far more. And when I was at the World Bank too, I felt that, you know, we've got within the multilateral system, within the multilateral banks, an extraordinary array of talent. And we need to harness that to uh, achieve the tasks that Mia Motley and others have uh, set us. So, 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 so to me, it is the leadership of the African Bank is showing, not just in terms of the work that's being done in Africa, which the President and others have ventilated so well today, but it's also in the inventiveness, the financial engineering that is coming out of the bank as we tackle these problems together. Thank you for that, right, Honorable Mitchell. And just pause it to me, let me come home here to Christoph Boris. Christoph, uh, I've got to go to you just looking at what was presented here. This is Africa. What did you pick out? This is a subject, uh, I'll switch to French. So that we may have actually a French speaking touch in our proceedings. Now, when this presentation was, was uh, very rich in information, the interest was see to see the contrast between the strengths and the weaknesses, strengths that are obvious for Africa. This was clearly explained throughout the presentation. Resources, tremendous demographics, the will, a bank, as we have all convened right here to support this bank to make the best use of the resources. This is a strong ship, but that sails against the wind. This is what I keep. There is soundness. We have charted a clear course. However, we are facing these strong headwinds that are generated by a situation that is provoked outside Africa with geopolitical events that bear issues with this imported inflation that causes tremendous damage, but also, of course, a challenge that is closely related to what is taking place right here in Africa. That is why the bank, as this were clearly stated in many uh, contributions, a bank that has provided a lot of theory in terms of assistance and help to Africa, whereby Africa can play a role because anything that will cement Africa from within using its own devices will help to steadfastly resist to this uneasy context. Thank you. Boris, let me now go uh, to our host, um, Governor Abdallah. Uh, just this, this report is about the African continent, and of course, the world is looking in to see how our economies are performing, to look at the risks, they will look at opportunities. And you heard from Professor Rama a whole list of opportunities. Risks, yes, but you made very good recommendations. What did you take away, sir? Thank you very much. And I'd first like to commend the report because of the facts. The literature is very good. And I would like to go to the core of the matter. Why do we need banks? 
don't see you moving that. So let me just move the microphone. When did they lose me from the beginning? Yes. So let me first commend the report. It's been very comprehensive, and uh, the conclusions are very telling. However, I would like to uh, address the issue from a more practical angle. We need the private sector not only for the funding, of course. We've all seen in all countries that the management of the private sector is way more efficient, at least on the long run. That's a fact. And the, the, the other side of it is the opportunities. Are there opportunities? Yes. According to the literature, there are trillions of dollars of opportunities. Third issue, is Africa well positioned? Yes. Africa is very well positioned with opportunities. And not only opportunities, with a competitive edge. Competitive edge of the resources, of the human capital, and more important, which is just bluntly that top, bottom, approach makes it easier to approach. So it boils down to the private sector. Do we, how can they, or, I mean, this is a question that we all know the answer to. Yourselves, your good selves, the audience, what motivates them is only one thing. This is not CSR business. No matter how much, how long you talk to them, it, the, the, the angle, and even this is a wrong angle, that they should, we should, Make sure that the return on equity the, uh, given to these private sector warrants this risk and even more than warrants this risk by a premium for the innovation and because of something new. Now, how can this be? The NDBs play a crucial role in this. They, they, they have already, and thanks to all of them, they've already increased the awareness a lot. Then comes we need to have financing norms, and these have been part of it in the report. Those financing issues, whether it is guarantees, whether it's sub-debt, whether it's hybrid debt, whether it's uh, 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 concessional financing, all this long-term offtakes, all this has to be packaged and ready so that the return on equity warrants. We never told the private sector go to food chains. So, the issue and the angle that I want to, to put is that our focus should be on mitigating these risks and practically coming up with packages that would be implementable in different countries or in different continents, and those packages would allow proper financing and proper return. Just one thing I want to highlight prior to, to finalizing my work, which is there is an issue that has not been addressed in the report yet. I haven't seen the whole report. But I would like to highlight to the audience, and I would like AFDB, if possible, to research. Usually in Africa, when we do uh, uh, long-term offtakes, we do it in foreign currency. And this provides a hindrance both for the private sector and the public sector. And uh, addressing this issue is key to the, a lot of the financing and a lot of the, the impediments providing the long-term financing. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that. When you talk about long-term financing, I think it's something which uh, Right Honorable uh, Anthony Bucci did allude to in his speech at the Chatham House late in April about the length of uh, the duration given uh, to Africa when they borrow money. Sometimes it's five years, which is too short. And you compare that to 30 years given to a mortgage borrower in the United Kingdom. It makes a difference how long uh, you're borrowing money for, isn't it? So, so the point I was making was that we appear to be able to save a bank in California in three days, but Zambia waits more than two years to get debt relief. And I was also pointing out the difficulties that some countries in Africa are only able to borrow for very short periods of time and have uh, very high rates of uh, interest. I'm thinking particularly of Malawi at the moment, but that contrasts within the uh, in Europe where our children can borrow at a fraction of that and for 30 or 40 years. So that was the point I was making, that the architecture needs to catch up with the problem. And, and I think there are signs that we're moving in the right direction. But the point I was making in the beginning is I think a lot of the thinking on this is coming out of the partnership which the African Bank has assembled. And we need to drive that agenda forward as fast as we can. Thank you so much for that. Let me now go to the far end. And uh, Dr. Heike Hamlet, 
from the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. You are making inroads into Africa. You've launched in Africa. You're in, based in Egypt. And um, I'm sure you're looking further south. But just first of all, the African Development Bank has just given you, free of charge, a very good report to rely on. What do you make of it? No, I think, first of all, I'm super happy to, re to see this enormous depth of analytics in this report. But actually what triggered uh, my interest most was the combination of what is needed is innovation, scale, and the right risk mitigants. And as a banker, I thought these are exactly the sort of three words I like. And what I heard also now from, of course, uh, the governor of the Egyptian Central Bank is what we need to do is get this mix of innovation, risk return, and scalability right to really attract the private sector at scale. And yes, I've been only... Um, in North Africa, active as, uh, for the EBRD, but we are looking south. But if I give an example from Egypt, if you look at Benban, um, at the time it was Africa's largest solar park, it really brought exactly these elements together. Innovation, the right risk return for the private and the public investor, and scalability for a large solar farm. And I think we can talk about this in a bit of time, but I think one of the slides I reckon I really looked at and thought, look at the enormous potential of the next phase of green technology, and that was look at the potential that this continent has on green hydrogen. There was this slide where you could really see the enormous potential, and there again, it's an opportunity uh, together with all the partners and on the leadership of the African Development Bank to look at how can all these things come together for harvesting this new potential of green energy that will be also the future for decarbonization, not this continent, but actually the world. And those opportunities and potential run into trillions of dollars as we saw. Let me come to your neighbor here at Masu Tedase from the Trade and Development Bank. The report as you saw, does it tally with your own assessment of Africa's economic performance? Well, it certainly does, but what it highlights, I think, in a very welcome way is the resilience that we keep talking about from the African Context, despite multiplicity of shocks, we're still able to generate real GDP growth that is above the global average without having all the stimuluses and all these amazing safety nets that you see the rest of the world enjoying. So I think, I think resilience has is, is, is been highlighted very nicely. But I, what I also found very interesting is, is the, 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 the scope to leverage natural capital. And, and for this report to be highlighting that, in, in Sharm el Sheikh, where COP27 took place, I think is very timely because we, we often talk in international development finance circles about leveraging the private sector. We talk about leveraging many things. I don't think I've heard the phrase leveraging natural capital in the same way the report has made out today. So I applaud the, the ADB for that. Yeah, and that is one of the recommendations that Professor Rama left us with. Later on, I'll be coming to you and uh, Dr. Hamgat for a bit of a ding dong there. We promised each other on that one. But let me just come back to Right Honorable Andrew Mitchell. Towards the end of April, while addressing and uh, delivering a speech at the Chatham House in London, you said this Today, we commit to persuading more of our fellow citizens that international development is core to our own national interests as well as the right thing to do. How exactly did you persuade? Well, it's a very interesting, though somewhat United Kingdom-centric debate, but we have in the United Kingdom a sort of 50-50 view. 50% 50 of the population believe that money should be spent on their schools and their um, uh, hospitals and so forth first and are less willing to see us spend money on international development. And 50% of the population think to a greater or lesser extent that this is an extremely good uh, spend, that it's the right thing to do, and to a, to a lesser extent, they appreciate that it's in our national interest. And the point I was making uh, in that speech at Chatham House was that we need in Britain to move the dial. People like me need to try and win an argument, we haven't yet won, that moves the dial to 70, 30, 70 percent of people supporting strongly international and uh, only 30% against. And that, you know, it has, it has gone up in the past, it's gone down a bit. Um, and my job, uh, and also the job of the new structure inside the Foreign Office of Britain, 
is to drive it up uh, within 10 years to 70, 30. And that's what we're intent on doing. And given that in the past, Britain has put its shoulder to the wheel and done a lot of the leadership on international development, that's, that's a, a, an accolade I want to win back. But I think that in order for Britain to really help and do what is required, I think it needs to move our domestic population to a better place as well. And so that, that's what I was talking about. And I think we have a very clear plan now to how to build that support. Um, and with that support, of course, comes the uh, better position on funding and so forth, which we all want to see. Yeah, and I don't want to lose this opportunity. I've got to ask you about the Africa-UK summit you're planning for next year. Yes, it goes to the point that some of my fellow panelists have been making about the private sector. In Britain, we massively reformed what used to be called CDC and is now called BII. And it's the British uh, International Investment Arm. And it's investing billions of pounds uh, across Africa. It's probably true to say that its investments, directly and indirectly, employ something like a million uh, people. Uh, and they paid over the last five years something like uh, $10 billion of tax. Now, we want to make sure through this uh, UK-Africa Investment Summit, which will be chaired by our Prime Minister next April, that we do everything we can to boost trade, investment and jobs throughout Africa and that we boost trade with our own country, from our own country, uh, driving up living standards. And that's why uh, the Prime Minister has invited um, African leaders and businessmen to come to, and women to come to and the last time we did this, uh, billions of uh, dollars of investment uh, flowed from it, uh, a huge number of deals across Africa, um, and a, a very large number of jobs were generated. So that's the aim next April. And thank you very much for giving me the opportunity of mentioning it today. Yes, and I know that is in April next year, but before that, we've got another summit in Paris. I think, Christoph, you're going to have there a summit for a new global financial pact. What does that mean? I don't know. Well, what that means is that uh, it's going to change the logic. What uh, President Macron wanted to present when he launched the idea of this summit is to uh, go beyond certain uh, futile oppositions which make us lose time and opportunities. The opposition between uh, development and uh, global commodities, uh, for example, and opposition, as Minister Mitchell said, between what is good for the population in some countries and what's good in other countries. And in fact, COVID has shown us that uh, uh, a pandemic could uh, affect everybody and climate is the same. So the logic of this uh, summit is to bring together everybody uh, and have the public and the private sectors, people from different categories of countries, um, people who also represent uh, philanthropy, uh, academics, put everybody around the same table and try and identify some simple principles which are common to us in order to develop uh, funding of development and uh, uh, global uh, uh, commodities. Um, uh, I'd like to thank President Adesina uh, uh, because he will be an important participant in the summit and uh, the bank teams have in fact uh, contributed a lot to the preparatory work for the summit. And the idea is to have the contributions and innovations from these different stakeholders <laughs> to uh, try and see what's uh, common for everybody and try and build coalitions. And this is what is being done in COP. But unfortunately, in COP, there were some strong oppositions between groups of countries. We should try and come up with a positive agenda which uh, brings us together on this matter and make specific announcements on the mobilization of private sector, but also others. Thank you. Who are mentioning uh, Dr. Deshina, the president of the African Development Bank, he walked in a short while and we'll be hearing from him shortly. But now, this is the moment I really wanted to introduce uh, a, a bit of uh, a different tack to this discussion. I want to hand over the microphone. My, I've got, we've got you as a, 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 a Dr. Ike, but I want to hand over my role to you briefly for two minutes 
uh, with your neighbor. Go on. No, thank you so much. And maybe a, um, a quick explanation. Um, we just had our global annual meeting of the EBRD last week in Samarkand, and um, we, there was a tremendous, imp tremendously important decision made, and namely our shareholders, some of them are sitting around, the, around this table, decided that uh, approve the expansion of the EBRD to Sub-Saharan Africa. So I couldn't be at a better place than being here in Sharm el at the African Development Bank annual meeting, who's been such a great partner in North Africa and such a great partner in this journey and telling with you, sharing with you this enormous um, decision that our shareholders took. So, we, so I'm in Cairo, I'm looking south, and we are really keen to support green growth together with our partners. We are a bank that does 75% the private sector, 25% the public sector, and with the new kids in the block in North Africa, but invested so far $20 billion in the last 10 years. So we want to see where can we work together with the African Development Bank, where can we complement everyone that's there, and where can we help accelerating growth green growth in Africa, and I couldn't think of a better panel and a better neighbor to ask this question. So what would your advice be? Well, first of all, I'd like to express my uh, happiness that <laughs> you, you, your footsteps in North Africa are moving southwards. I had heard you had arrived in the continent, but was waiting to see you where I am in Kenya and, and, in, and in Southern Africa as well. Uh, in a nutshell, I think uh, clearly the, the, the development region of Africa has many financing gaps. We, we, we heard from AFDB on the climate financing gaps. We often hear about infrastructure financing gaps. For those that haven't heard the numbers in the trade finance space, it's over $100 billion per annum. And, and I know that's one of the things that the EBRD can do quite easily, among other things, of course, such as longer term financing. And, and here, I think, um, there's a huge opportunity for you to come in and very quickly uh, step into that segment of the financing landscape and, and, and provide much needed uh, support to, to banks and financial institutions who really need credit enhancement in order to issue letters of credit and trade with the rest of the world. We do a great deal of that as TDB, and, and I must say, uh, in case you're curious as to whether it's feasible or not, you can ask PII, who the Honorable um, Mitchell had uh, mentioned, was active in Africa. They've worked very closely with us in uh, providing risk participations and guaranteeing trade between Africa and the rest of the world, but also between African countries as part of the AFCFTA. So I, I would warmly welcome you into that space. Um, the British have done it and they've not suffered, and I promise you will not either. Thank you so much. Okay, so you see you are in good company. Excellent. And just to tell the audience, the, you know, when I introduced Dr. Heike, I said she was selected amongst the top 10 most powerful women in business in the Middle East for two consecutive years, 2020 and 2021. So a big round of applause to her, please. So as we wrap this up, because I know we are all pressed for time, let me come to our host, Governor Abdallah. Early this year, your government announced the privatization of 32 state-owned enterprises worth 40 billion US dollars. What does this say about the government's commitment towards the private sector growth in this country? Well, thank you for the question. Of course, that doesn't fall under the domain of the Sultan, right? But I'm more than happy to entertain it for the Egyptian sense. Because I believe there is a lot of uh, issues that should be the Egypt has always been pro-private sector. The private sector has always been strong with the ratios growing at, at sometimes up to 70 and 80 percent of GDP. Then we had some uh, incidents in 2011 which have resulted in the private sector being uh, reluctant to put extra investments in the company needed a lot of investments. That made a shift for the last years. What I'm, what I'm confident of now is it's not only about the 32 companies, there is a whole very focused program, and I believe that the market will be pleasantly surprised by the pace, and more important, the process from now on. So I understand from my coordination with the government that they are working strongly and diligently 
in order to have a transparent, clear process and to have the private sector being more than welcome into the country. Thank you. And I think your message is cut across loud and clear. Ladies and gentlemen, I know we are pressed for time. Let's give a round of applause to our panel, beginning with Dr. Hamgat, Admaso Tedesi from Trade and Development Bank, our governor, our host, Governor Abdallah, <laughs> Right Honorable Andrew Mitchell from the United Kingdom, and Chris Bo Christopher Boris from France. A big round of applause for them as well. Okay. So this is what we're going to do. I'm going to ask my guests to go back and take their seats, and I will go back to the podium to welcome the president of the, development, of the African Development Bank Group, Dr. Akiumi Adeshina, to deliver his speech. Thank you, but I will let them... Well, thank you very much, um, Solomon. And, and uh, it's just wonderful to have come in when that's such a great panel. I understand that's been a presentation by the Chief Economist, uh, Professor uh, Chikau Rama. Uh, and it's great to see uh, my friends, um, Honor Right Honorable Andrew Mitchell uh, from the UK, uh, Admaster Tedese, uh, the President in, uh, of the TDB. Uh, of course, uh, His Excellency Hassan Abdallah, uh, the Central Bank Governor, and of course the Chair of the African Development Bank uh, Board of Governors, uh, Christophe uh, Boris, merci pour votre participation dans cette discussion. And thank you very much, uh, Dr. Heike Hamgat uh, from the uh, EBRD. We're glad to have you in Africa. I'm glad we've been talking about this for quite some time. I'm glad that it finally uh, worked out. So, soyez le bienvenu uh, dans l'Afrique. Your Excellences, uh, I actually was supposed to have been at the front end of this before Professor Rama uh, will have made his presentation, but my schedule with meetings uh, not made it possible for me to be here uh, earlier. So apologies for that, but I'm glad that I can make some remarks uh, on this report. I'd like to really thank you for attending this launch of the flagship report, uh, the African Economic Outlook for 2023. The African Development Bank puts great priority on the development of knowledge products to inform policymakers on the performance of the continent to look at current and emerging global economic, financial, and geopolitical challenges and risks and how to tackle important issues such as debt, public financial management for sustainable development. As we gather today, the world is facing multiple challenges, including climate change, inflation driven by higher prices for energy, commodities, and disruption, of course, of the supply chains due to the ongoing war, Russia and Ukraine. And the tightening of the monetary policies in the United States and Europe has led to rising interest rates that are compounding debt service payments for African countries. The report, I'm sure, as Professor Rama must have mentioned, shows that, that in the face of these challenges, African economies have demonstrated remarkable, remarkable resilience. The continent achieved an average growth rate of 3.8% in three, 2022. This year was 4.1% and projected also for 2023-2024. And that surpasses the global average of 3.4%. But although I want to say that while that is great and we are able to keep our head above water, uh, we all agree that poverty is still very high in Africa. And I think Africa needs to be growing at double digit to be able to have the kind of transformation that we have. But nonetheless, uh, it's very good in very tough times to see that we are quite, quite resilient and able to post uh, these kind of growth rates. Uh, of course, I'm sure that you will have listened to Professor Urama that the growth that we are talking about was fairly heterogeneous. Heterogeneous because if you look at the oil I mean, tourism uh, focused countries, they actually suffered uh, a declining growth because, I mean, an increase rather, 
uh, in growth because of early recovery uh, in the in the migrant countries that uh, normally will uh, do a lot of tourism. The oil exporting countries suffered negative uh, a declining growth because of the um, I mean, they, they experienced a boost in growth, rather, uh, because the global oil prices remained high. And the resource-intensive countries suffered a deceleration in growth because of their lack of diversification and the lower prices of commodities, especially minerals, because of the weakening global growth. And the non-resource-intensive countries, where they had a lot more diversification, experienced higher growth. And that's a big lesson there. They need to diversify economies and also focus on regional trade, uh, especially the Africa continental free trade area to reduce this kind of volatilities. So it's clear that African countries are moving in the right direction. I was particularly pleased to see in this report that five out of the six pre-pandemic top performing countries um, are said to be back uh, in the league of the world's 10 fastest growing economies for 2023 and 2024. The external financial inflows to Africa, including foreign direct and portfolio investment, official development assistance, and remittances, have rebounded to approximately 20%, reaching $26.6 billion, or about 7.5% increase of GDP in 2021. This is up from roughly $180 billion, or 7.4% of GDP in 2020, during the COVID-19 pandemic. However, all countries, whether they are growing or whether they are declining in terms of their growth rates, all face compounding challenges. And that arises from high inflation globally, the contractory monetary policies in developed economies, especially the US and the EU, that have led to rising interest rates that are causing rapid increases in debt service costs with a stronger dollar leading to devaluation of currencies, driving up imported inflation, and of course, capital flight of portfolio investors. The report shows that 25 countries are either in high risk or in debt distress. They saw the highest increase in debt service payments. So of course, the longer the monetary policy of raising interest rates, the higher the debt vulnerabilities of countries that I've just mentioned. And this is especially critical as the debt service payments due for Africa in 2023-2025 will rise from $22 billion to $26 billion, which will lead, in fact, to more debt distress. So also challenging is a high level of domestic debt that needs to be restructured. Short tenure of this debt, as well as high coupon rates they incur, further complicates debt vulnerabilities of many countries. It is clear from this report that even as we think about the uh, restructuring of the external debt in Africa, we have to suddenly look at domestic debt restructuring as equally important. As African central banks also raise interest rates, the weakened demand for financial services will increase the risk to financial stability unless banks are supported with capital and liquidity buffers. The rising global interest rates have had negative effects on portfolio investments in Africa, with an outflow of portfolio investments increasing from $8.1 billion in 2020 to roughly $28 billion in 2021. However, remittances from the report, we saw the analysis shows remittances continue to help to boost recovery as this increased across several countries due to better than expected economic recovery in the migrant destination countries. In fact, the remittances increased from $84 billion in 2020 to roughly $96 billion in 2021. I think this is particularly instructive to pay attention to as the war in Ukraine has led to a shrinking of the net official development assistance to Africa. The net ODA to Africa declined by 7.4% in real terms from $37 billion 
in 2021 to $34 billion. And I must say that's the lowest in the past 12 years. So that calls for greater effort by Africa to mobilize more domestic resources. Also, it is critical to ensure that we have a coordinated, a better coordinated and more efficient debt treatment between official and private creditors and ensure that the G20 common framework works for African countries. Other policy recommendations include industrial policies that can accelerate the diversification of African economies and the expansion of regional trade to lower exposure to global volatilities. The report went extensively into climate change and climate finance. And sticking out is the fact that Africa is being shortchanged by climate finance. The continent would need between $235 to $250 billion annually through 2030 to meet investments under the nationally determined contributions. And yet Africa gets only $30 billion in terms of climate finance. Of particular concern, which is linked to the purpose of this annual meeting, the focus of this annual meeting on private sector financing, is that public sector finance is six times that of private finance. Private flows of private finance into Africa is actually the lowest in the world. So the Africa's private financing gap is estimated by this report to reach $213 billion annually to 2030. So there's a lot of work to do, and private sector financing for climate will need to rise by at least 36% annually through that period. This explains, as I said, why we chose this particular issue at this annual meeting as our main focus. The report recommends several ways to attract private climate financing, including green bonds, debt for nature swaps, green banks, blended finance, and carbon markets. Africa needs to do a lot more to attract a significantly higher share of the green bonds, when we're talking green bonds, because we only account for 0.2% of the $2.2 trillion of green bonds issued cumulatively up through 2022. The report also shows clearly that Africa can accelerate its development by optimizing its natural capital. And Tadessa was just talking about that at the panel. And that natural capital is estimated at $6.2 trillion. However, the continent is not getting the best out of its natural resources because of poor valuation, degradation, illicit capital flows, and losses of its royalties and taxes. Expanding private sector participation in green growth will require several policy interventions including strengthening the capacities to develop long-term strategies on green growth. I think it's important that we also develop appropriate regulations and incentives, support project preparation and project development, and the development of stronger capital markets that can support exits from investments made by the private sector. It will also require some top choices, in particular for the fossil fuel subsidies, that needs to be eliminated. In most cases, they are quite inefficient, they are too expensive, and they benefit the rich, not the poor. And the same amount of money people are using, countries are using to subsidize, then they go back to the market and borrow a lot to do that. So we do need to have this issue critically looked at. The greater use of blended finance can help. Deployment of the risky facilities needs to be done at scale. And we need the development of platforms that can allow private sector to invest in a portfolio of green projects as opposed to individual projects to allow them to diversify and to manage their risks. So there are just so many insights and policy recommendations in this report. I encourage that you actually get a copy of it to read through it. I'm sure that you will find this report to be both insightful, action-oriented, and very useful as we look for ways to substantially raise private capital uh, for financing climate and green growth in Africa.
Let me now thank the Vice President and Chief Economist of the Bank, Professor Ken Queen Rama, your team, and all the collaborating teams that you have within the bank and also outside the bank that help for this uh, production of this report, which I consider an excellent uh, report. So therefore, Mr. Vice President, great job, and congratulations to you and your team. It is now my great pleasure, instead of calling you to actually make the presentation of the report, to come on stage so we can formally uh, actually launch the report. Thank you very much, and welcome to this evening. Thank you very much, the President of the African Development Bank Group, Dr. Kumi Adeshina. Another round of applause for him, please. And yes, he's now being joined by Professor Rama for the unveiling. May I also invite the Governor um, of the bank, our host, Governor Abdallah, please join Dr. Adeshina and Professor Rama on stage. May I also invite the bank's Vice President for Finance and Chief Finance Officer, Hasatun Sele, please, if you can join Dr. Deshina, Professor Rama, and Governor Abjala on stage. Uh, and our special guest is still around. Yes, thank you so much. Right Honorable Andrew Mitchell, if you can come on stage, please. Thank you. So they are going to be uh, handed uh, the report. Uh, we have got um, some copies of the report. Yeah, there you go. So photographers, if you can take that one first and then we'll bring in the report. Uh, if you can have one more report, please, that would be very good. Okay, let's now hand over. It's now time, ladies and gentlemen, to unveil the 2023 African Economic Outlook report from the African Development Bank Group. Yes, we've got one more copy being, uh, being brought. There's one copy. Yes, there, there you go. And now our guests are going to show it to you. And photographers, if you get a moment, uh, for a few minutes, then you'll clear the stage. Thank you. So the report has now been officially unveiled, and you're all going to get a copy as you leave this venue. You'll get a copy. And may I uh, thank our guests, the president of the African Development Bank, Dr. Deshina, Right Honorable Andrew Mitchell, Governor Abdallah, Vice President Hassatun Zele, and Vice President Professor Urama. If you can take your seats, please, that would be very good. That's what partnership is about. When you can have that face-to-face, um, -face, eyeball to eyeball, close-up look. That's what partnerships and friendships are all about. Thank you so much. Let's give them a round of applause, please.